Good afternoon. This is the Bishop's Desk. I pray that you all having a great day. Um, thank God for being in this space once again. Forgive me, we were not able to make it into the Bishop's Desk on last week uh, due to some malfunctions with my device. I actually dropped my device and cracked it all up. And so I was unable to put the uh, message out, but we're here. Anything that can be done to try to hinder us from growing in the word of God, believe me, that will happen. But we thank and praise God for being in control of all things. And again, I pray that all is well. I pray that the Bishop's death is being a blessing to you, that you're learning the word of God, and that in, to, in, that in your intimate time and space, that the word of God is blessing you. I know it's blessing me uh, to be able to share the word of God and to be able to go through the scriptures at a slow pace and to see what the scriptures are saying to us. And so we're here in First Peter. We're going to go right into the word. And uh, we finished, uh, we started off in First uh, Peter chapter 2. So turn your Bibles to First Peter chapter 2. Again, it is a blessing to be able to go into the word of God. And it's good to uh, put your comments there. Put your comments there. Something that may be missed, something that uh, may be in your spirit. Put your comments there uh, and share. Share. Share the bishop's desk with your friends. Share the bishop's desk on your platforms. Um, and if it's a being a blessing to you, allow it to be a blessing to somewhere else, to somebody else. Amen. So, um, First Peter, First Peter, chapter two. Again, a new Peter, a new you a new Peter, a more mature Peter, a more mature you. And so we're learning the word of God and we're allowing the word of God to build us, to build us upon the foundations of the knowledge of truth, the knowledge of truth that the Lord Jesus delivered unto us. Amen. And so Christ, our cornerstone. So Peter talks here, um, acknowledging that Christ is our cornerstone cornerstone um, you start building from the corner of a building that's where you you begin from the corner you don't start in the middle you have four corners in a building and the building begins in the at the corners they begin to put the corners in first because that's your support most of your support comes from the corners and then they begin to build to the next corner amen and so Christ the cornerstone the foundation of the body of Christ. And so here Peter begins to teach us. And so he said, wherefore laying aside, I'm going back to verse um, two, wherefore laying aside all malice and all speaking. Amen. He said, laying all those things aside. Forgive me one second. Um, I'm sorry. Laying all those things aside, all malice and all guile and all hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings. He says, laying all those things aside. Amen. As you lay all those things aside, he says, now, um, uh, he says, now we are to mature as new babes, as we lay those things aside, as we lay those things aside. Amen. He says us for us to mature, for us to mature as new babes and for us to desire the sincere milk. Okay. The sincere milk of what? The sincere milk of the word of God. He used the analogy of milk because milk, we know that when a baby is born, a baby nutrients and, and their meal is in the form of milk. The mother breast produces milk for the baby. So as a baby, the Bible used that analogy. 
desire the sincere milk of the word. The word of God becomes milk to us the same way that milk is provided from the mother uh, to the baby. So he says for us to desire that. Amen. And she says, if in verse three, if so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. So if, if the Lord has done anything for you, if you have experienced in your life that the Lord has, has, has brought you to this place and he has been gracious, he has been kind, he has been merciful, he has opened up doors in your life, he has brought you through um, the trials of your life, amen, he said for you, that is the taste, that's the experience, this word taste here is experience, right, it's not a physical thing, all of this is metaphorically speaking, all of this is is like uh, similar to the Bible talks about. Um, so he says, if you have tasted, if you have experienced in your life at any point that God has been gracious and kind to you, right? He says for you to desire the sincere milk of the word, amen? Because it's going to be the word of God that's going to keep you, that's going to shape you, it's going to mold you, um, it's going to build you up. It is the cornerstone. It is the cornerstone in which you should build your life, right? No other foundation can any man lay than that which has already been laid, right, by Jesus Christ. Um, you don't go and, and take the cornerstone out and, and put something else there. You build on it. And so we are, again, we are, the Bible talks about us as lively stones, amen? We are lively stones, built on the foundation of Jesus Christ. And this is what Paul begins to break open here in, in this chapter. So he says, if you have experienced the Lord and he's been gracious to you, your mindset should change as if you was a baby needing to be fed, needing to be fed by the Lord. The Lord is the word of God. Amen. Um, he said in, let me see if I can find it. Psalms. Go to Psalms 40. Go to Psalms 40 real quick. Keep your finger there uh, in Peter, but go to Psalms 40 because we're talking about the word being the Lord. Let's see, let's see what Psalms 40, beginning in verse 6. Psalms 40 and 6, sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. Mine ears has thou opened. Burnt offerings and sin offering has thou not required. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me. He said, I come. In the volume of, a book, of the book, the word of God, God takes himself and he forms himself into a book of knowledge, scriptures, uh, epistles, letters for our learning so that we would be able to understand him in our, in, in our way of thinking. He understood best because he created us. So he comes, he says, in the volume of the book, right? So he tells us to desire him, the sincere milk of the word, because he come in the volume of the book. He came in the volume of words for our knowledge, for our learning. So he says to desire the word of God, desire the book and which I transform myself into being, desire that. Because while being in this body, 
you'll experience me through my word, my knowledge, my truth. So back in, 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 in 1 Peter 2, if you have tasted, if you have experienced, if you haven't experienced him, then and you'll and you'll hear with us for the first time and 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 you haven't been studying with us and somehow you've came across this teaching and somehow it was passed to you or you just stumbled upon it. In order to experience God, God must first send his spirit upon you. And then once that change has taken place within your heart. The Bible says we must repent of our sins, right? So he talks about repentance in several places of the Bible, but one of the most used scriptures is Romans. If you if again, if you if you have haven't been with us, but if you have been with us, go to Romans chapter 10. He says in Romans chapter 10, beginning in verse 9. And again, if this is your first time, the Bible says faith come by hearing. So I'm not expecting for you to have a Bible and to, or if you do have a Bible, um, go to Romans 10 and 9. He says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, confession must be made with your mouth. Because he's the cornerstone. And thou shalt believe in thy heart that God have raised him from the dead. If you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, that Jesus is no more dead. He says, Thou shalt be saved. Your life will be saved in will be saved in the eternal. Amen. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. So you believe unto the righteous act of God raising. That was a righteous act that happened at Calvary. And you believe that, that God raised Jesus from the dead. If you believe that righteous act that God performed, the Bible says thou shalt be saved. And that has to take first, even before the confession, believe in it. Then the confession is made. And with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So you must believe first that God raised Jesus from the dead. And then you must confess that with your mouth, that you believe that. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Then, and there's no, there's no embarrassment. There's no shame there. You're proud. You're proud to, to, to announce that truth. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. So we won't go into all of that. But the salvation and the and the process of receiving the salvation, you've already received it because God has already sent it upon you. And because God has already sent it upon you, the shame leaves away because the heart has been changed. Anything that you believe, you're not ashamed to speak it because you believe it. Right. And so. The change is already taking place. God chose you. You didn't choose him. You didn't even know it happened. You just had just things started happening in your life and it began to be revealed to you that your heart was changing. You begin to view things differently. You begin to feel differently about things. You begin to have a different approach on life. Right. And then the things that you were attracted to once in your life, you begin to lose an attraction for those things and you begin to become attracted to the things that are right because God changed your heart. And so now that he has changed your heart, you must believe that he changed your heart. Amen. And so then salvation is bestowed upon you. Amen. And so he says, if you have tasted, that's an experience. If you have tasted that the Lord has been gracious, then desire the word of God. Right. Because that's an experience all by itself when God changed your life from a sinner to a righteous man or woman of God. That's an experience all by itself. And if you've experienced that, if you're here with us today and this is your first time, it's very well that you may have experienced that. You may have tasted that God has been kind and gracious. So and now that you believe that desire the word. So he says, 
in verse 4, in verse 4, 1 Peter, let's go back to 1 Peter, verse 4. He says, to whom coming as unto a lively stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. This here is talking about Jesus here. And then he makes a comparison with us. We'll, we'll, we'll go into that. Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. So he makes the comparison of Jesus and us. But look, at, let's look at Jesus. He says, to whom coming? To whom coming? Who was the Lord coming to? Those of us that were lost. Those of us who had become, who had become aliens to the kingdom of God. Those of us who had no hope. Because of sin, I won't go into every line, but because of sin, because of Adam's sin, we were no longer in relationship with God. One man sinned and broke the relationship with God humanity you had nothing to do with it but human 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 beings broke adam broke the relationship between god and man and it just it was a generational cycle that's when you hear people talk about let's break the generational curse okay there was a curse put upon us through sin through adam's sin and every man is, is, is part of that generational curse from Adam. And it must be broken through his belief. That curse of Adam's sin is still relevant and resting on a lot of people's lives. Because a lot of people don't believe. But once you believe... Once you have tasted, experienced, once you have confessed your sins before God and believed that God has raised Jesus from the dead, you have experienced God, that he is gracious, that generational curse of man's sin was broken against you through Jesus Christ. So to whom coming? To, the, to humanity. That's who Christ was coming to. Humanity for a purpose. OK. As unto a lively stone. Jesus Christ was is a lively stone. And he was coming unto a lively stone. Humanity. Jesus coming to humanity as unto a lively stone. As, as he was coming, as, just like, just like you and I. He wrapped himself in a body of flesh, just like you and I. Coming, whom, us, Jesus was coming to, as, just like a lively stone, just like a human being. He puts himself in human flesh, Jesus does. He come just like us. To make sacrifice for us. However. He was disallowed indeed of men. We know that Christ was rejected. Right? Okay. Um, let's see. Let's see what Isaiah 53 and 3 say. Isaiah 53 and 3. Isaiah 53 and 3. He was rejected. And so I'm going this way because once you've experienced him and once you change, the process almost resembles the same that Christ went through. You'll be rejected. You'll be rejected by your family. You'll be rejected by your friends. You'll be rejected by your loved ones. You'll be rejected by your acquaintances. Why? Because your life has changed and you no longer, you no longer 
uh, desire to do the things or, 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 or live your life the way you used to. So you'll be rejected of men the same way Christ was rejected. Let's see what uh, Isaiah 53 and 3 says. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. So he says, Jesus, he was despised and rejected of men. What men? His very own. He came to his own and they received him not. He came to the Jew first. They did not receive him. It had already been prophesied that he would be rejected of his own. It's already been prophesied that you and I, once we, once we take, let, once we allow, receive the word of God and let this mind be in us that was also in Christ Jesus, right? As we allow the same mind that was in Christ to be in us, we will be despised and rejected of men. Why? Because something changes about you. When change come, change brings uh, change will uproot, change will uh, uh, cause problems, right? He says, he was despised and rejected of men. Despised. Hey, Google, what is the definition of despised? Here's the definition of despise. Feel contempt or a deep repugnance for feel contempt or deep repugnance for, to go against. They went against Christ. He was despised. He was rejected. And he was a man of sorrow because when you change, when change come in your life, sorrow come because The way people respond to you now, it breaks your heart. And so Christ was acquainted with that. He was acquainted with grief, which means he had experiences often with grief. When you desire to live your life right or righteously, you will always be acquainted with grief. You're, go, you're going to always have kickback. You're going to always have pushback. You're going to always have opposition because of the right that you desire to do. Because now you're desiring to live like Christ, to let the mind of Christ be in you. You're going to be acquainted with the pushback, the grief, the brokenness. Of, of disappointment because you're not accepted anymore. And that's okay. But it says, and we hid as it were our faces from him. Sometimes, sometimes people will, will hide from that. They will hide from who God has changed them to be. This is what he's saying here. God has changed you. And sometimes you will hide from that because of the grief and because of the sorrow and because of the dis of being despised and rejected. Sometimes you will hide who you are to please man, but you can't please man. You must please God. You must be acquainted with the reactions of people not accepting you for who you are now. And so he says, they hid their faces from him. They hid from who they were. They were ashamed of who they were. Not that they not that they wanted to just uh not acknowledge Christ, but when change come and when people put pressures on you and when life put pressures on you, sometimes people will fold up and they will not live their true life of who they are now. They will begin to live their life as men pleasers. And that's the worst thing that we can do is live our life as a man pleaser because man, he changes every day. Matter of fact, man changes sometime a couple times within a day. And if you live in your life based on what man says versus what the Bible says, 
then you're going to always, you're going to always be acquainted more with grief. You're going to always be acquainted with more sorrows. Why the Bible said, let your yea be yea and your nay be nay. And be proud of that. Be okay with that. Amen. So go back to first Peter. First Peter, he says he is disallowed, disallowed. Uh, two and four. A. Um, the stone is living in that it is personal. Furthermore, he is a life giving stone. Christ as the son of God has life in himself. Amen. He's a living stone. We are too. He's the living water. He's the living bread. He's the living way. Disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God. Yes. A. Hey. Okay. Psalms 118.22. Psalms 118.22. Go there and see what that says. Psalms 118.22. The cornerstone. Psalms 118.22. The stone which the builders refused to become the head stone of the corner. The stone which the builders refused. Who was the builders? The builders are the people who were supposed to follow Christ. Because he is the cornerstone, we are the builders. He built the cornerstone with his self and he allowed us to build upon him based on the materials that he provided to us which is the word of God so he gave it to us and he gave us free ground to be able to use that to build upon him that's why the bible says add nothing to the word of God or take nothing away from the word of God use the materials that God has provided to you to build upon him because we can't build anything other than the word of God onto the word of God. So he says, the stone which the builders refused. Jesus, Jesus is that stone. They refused him. He is become the headstone of the corner. He has become the headstone. They have refused him. But he has become the head stone, and that's not going to change. There's no other. There's no other headstone that's there. There's no other foundation that's there that we can build upon, but the foundation of Christ that has already been laid. So they reject it. They reject him. We reject him just, we reject him when we don't desire the sincere milk of the word as he instructed us to. We begin to hide our face from him when we don't follow the instruction that he has instructed us to follow. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Everything that's going on is the uh, Psalms. The, the writer in Psalms uh, exhortation to praise God for his mercy. It says this is the Lord's doing in verse 23. This is the day which the Lord have made. We will rejoice and be glad in it because all of this the Lord created. Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord, O Lord, I beseech thee. Send now prosperity. Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. God is the Lord. God is the Lord. This right here is another confirmation that Jesus is God. 
God is Jesus. In verse 27, Psalms 118, 27, God is the Lord. Who is the Lord? The Lord is Jesus. The Bible says God is the Lord. This is why we can't separate God from being Jesus and Jesus from being God, because it clearly says here, God is the Lord, which have showed us light bind the sacrifice with cords, even unto the horns of the altar. Thou art my God, and I will praise thee. Thou art my God, I will exalt thee. O give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for he is merciful, for his mercy endure forever. God is Jesus. Jesus is God. So he's disallowed. Indeed of men. Indeed, he's disallowed. Indeed, surely man rejects Christ. But chosen of God, he was chosen of God, regardless of what the world says, regardless of, of what we feel. Jesus was chosen by God, just like you were chosen by God. And he was precious and you're precious. This is why Jesus Christ come and look, this is why he come as unto a living stone. This is why he come as us, because we're precious, because he knew that we were going to be disallowed. He knew that we were going to be rejected. He knew that we were going to be despised. He knew that because he had already prophesied that, that he would experience that. And so he knew that we would experience that coming out of sin, being acquainted with sin. He knew that once we would change from being acquainted with sin, but to live holy unto righteousness, he knew that we would be rejected, disallowed, and, and despised of men. He knew that. So he said, but just like God chose me, God chose you. Just like I'm precious unto God, you're precious too. So he says, He's precious. He came as a precious stone. When you think about precious stones in the earth, the analogy that God makes when he makes comparison to Jesus, he says he's precious, but he's, he comes as a stone, the analogy as a stone. And so when you think about stones in the earth, you think about the, the diamond being probably one of the most precious stones. Um, gold is, is, is the most precious stone. Rubies, all of these stones that are precious, right? He makes the analogy of being, of Jesus being precious like those stones. So when you think about, when you think about real clear diamonds and the, the gold before it's melted down in its pureness. He, he makes that analogy. And that's the only thing that we could imagine in our minds that our minds could um, um, tie it to being close is a very beautiful diamond, a very beautiful piece of gold. Uh, the analogy of how precious that is, Christ is even more precious than that. You can't even compare his stone or those stones to his stone. You can't, you take the, the most clearest diamond and the most uh, uh, precious piece of gold and you compare it to the stone of Christ, it can't even compare. That's how precious God is. Because when you think about, he said, chosen of God. Think about God going into the earth and pulling out a precious stone. Just think about that. You have men who go into the earth and they, and they, and they dig and they go to pull out 
the, the best stone that they could find. And then they begin to, to sell it at its value. But they always looking for the best. And sometimes they find the best that man can find. But think about God going and choosing a stone. He creating all the stones. He creating the entire universe. He know where all the precious stones are, but he goes and he chooses a stone. Not the stone that man has chosen, which is beautiful. But think about the stone that God chose when he went and chose a stone. It was precious. It was precious in the form where what it was going to be able to produce and what it was going to be able to do, the value of it. You take the, the purest diamond, the purest gold in the world, and you cut it down and you sell it. You only can sell it, but for so much. Doesn't matter. A lot of money. But you take the stone, the rock of Jesus, this stone is so valuable that this stone, it's living. This stone is the bread of life. This stone is the living way. This stone is, is, is the water, is living water. Amen. This is what this stone is. We can live off of this stone. This stone will heal the body. This stone will heal the nations. This stone will mend broken hearts. This stone will do what the physical stones can't do. This stone has no value to it in dollar amount. Because there's no dollar amount that you can find that is equivalent to pay for it. It's beyond the dollar amount. You can take every dollar piece of currency that has been printed and destroyed and you can bring it all back to the world and all of that is still not enough to pay for the stone of Jesus because when you're broken and you're sick money can't help you but so far when you are lonely and you're in despair and your heart is failing you, money cannot go into those places and pay for that. But the stone of Jesus can go and it can repair and pay for the things that the physical dollar can't pay for. That's how precious he is. And then he makes a comparison in verse 5. He says, ye also. Who is ye? The Gentile. The people. Human race. He says, ye also. Lively stones. The believers. Are not literal pieces of rock. But are persons. You and I. That's what he's talking about when he says ye. In addition, they derive their life from Christ. He says we derive our life from Christ. Our new life is developed out of Christ. The, the new man that's in you, his new ways, his new train of thinking, his new thought process, it is derived out of it is when you say derived out of it is created out of Christ Jesus it is created out of the word of God so when you begin to build your new life your life is built out of the materials because when you're building anything you're using materials so the materials that you use now are the materials out of the word of God we saw Christ came, lo, I come in the volume of the book, the word of God. 
So now you begin to build your life out of the word of God. Because we are lively stones. Ye also as lively stones. We begin to, our lives are now coming out of Christ. Who is the original living stone to whom they have come. Jesus Christ, he's the original living stone. He was the first living stone. So now ye also, also. In conjunction to Christ, we too as lively stones. We're lively stones now because Christ came. He called us out of darkness into the light. So now we're lively stones. A lively stone is something that can produce because it's living now and it's no longer dead. Before, before Christ came into your life, you were a dead stone, yet alive. But now that you are a lively stone because of Christ, he has come into your life, he has changed your heart, right? You are Christ-like now. He is the original lively stone. The Bible says that he has first preeminence over all things. He has the first of all things, so he would be the first living stone. Now that, our, now that we are lively stones, we're only alive because of him. We only live because of him. In him we have our living, we, our, our moving. In him we dwell, and in him we move. Because of him, in him, we have our being. Because of him, we are lively stones. Right? He says, are built up. So now, we are built up. We're built up upon what? A spiritual house. So now, we're building up our spirit man. We're building up our mind, our hearts. Using... The spiritual principles of the word. Using the word of God. Let's just keep it simple. We're using the word of God as a diagram of how we should look. Can't make it no more simple than that. We're using the word of God as a diagram of how we should look. Hey Google, what is a diagram? Here's the definition of diagram, a simplified drawing showing the appearance, structure, or workings of something, a schematic representation. A drawing showing the schematics, a drawing showing how something is supposed to look. That's a diagram. The word of God is the diagram of what we should look like. It's the schematics of how we should look now that we are lively stones. We're no longer dead because when you're dead, that just simply means that you have not believed that God raised Jesus from the grave and salvation has been given unto you through the death of Jesus Christ. You're dead. You're alive, but you're dead. You're dead because your name is not written on the Lamb's book of life and when and when you die and leave this world, you will die to an eternal hellfire. But now that you believe that Jesus Christ has been risen from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Now you are a lively stone. Now that you are a lively stone because of your belief in him, in his faith, because you believe in his faith, now you have been transformed to a lively stone. Now that you are a lively stone, amen? He says you are built up. You are to use the diagram of the word of God to shape your life. He went back and when we started in verse one, he says, and in beginning in the shaping and the forming of your life using the diagram, you should lay aside malice. You should lay aside guile, hypocrisies, envies, and evil speakings. That's groundbreaking right there. Because before you can build, you got to clear out. 
And you can only when you when a builder go and build, he must get permits. He just can't go and tear up ground and start building. He must get permission. He must get permits to build. Once Jesus Christ come into your life and save you, you have been given the permit. You have been given the permit, the right to go and do the clean out that needs to be done in order to use the new materials to build this new building. So you find this lot, you. It's vacant. It's run down. You must go in and you must pull out all the malice, trash it. God would be the dumpster. He would be the dumpster. You are to take all the malice and put it into the dumpster. You are to take all the guile that's in you and put it in the dumpster. All the hypocrisies and put it in the dumpster. All the envies and evil speakings and put them in the dumpster. Call the owner of the company, which is God, Jesus themselves, himself, himself, because they are one. You to call them and tell them to come and pick it up. Because these things God want us to give to him. Because they belong to him. All the trash in you belongs to God. And he wants you to give it to him. And now you are to use the schematics, the diagram. The blueprints of the word of God to build on this new foundation, which is Christ Jesus, a spiritual house. Right, because now you are a lively stone and now this house needs to produce. Some use. This land need to be useful now. Useful to God. God need to be able to occupy this new space that you have cleaned out for him so that he can be glorified. And as you do that and clean that out, people in the neighborhood, they're not going to want you to be there. There's always rejection when new construction come in. There's somebody in the neighborhood that says, we don't need that in here. We don't want that around here. There's always going to be somebody that's going to kick against the new building that's coming up. They're going to be disallowed. But God chose this. It, because it's precious. It's going to produce more. It's going to be more beneficial to the community than they can even ever imagine. Because it's precious. Because God chose it. But you're going to always have somebody that's going to go down and fight against you building this new building. Thank you, Holy Ghost. A holy priesthood. And as you build it, it must be holy. It must be holy. Available unto God. The house is a spiritual in a metaphorically sense, but also in that it is formed and dwelt by the spirit of God. It must be holy. It must be holy in order for the spirit of God to dwell there. Every stone in the house has been made alive by the Holy Spirit. Every stone that has been used to build this house it has been alive through the Holy Spirit sent by the exalted living stone sent by Christ. The Old Testament provides the background of this passage. John 2.19, 1 Corinthians 3.16. Let's see what John 2.19 says. John 2.19 John John 2.19 See what that says John 2.19 G 
Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Jesus was saying how once they destroy this temple, in three days he will go into the earth, and he will come back up, and he will build it back up. Amen. Let's look at um, 1 Corinthians 3.16. First Corinthians three sixteen. Let's see what that says. First Corinthians three sixteen. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? So as you build, you got to be careful how you build, because every stone that you build and use is holy. It must be holy because you are the temple of the living God. So as you build, you must build, you must use holy stones, stones that are alive, right? Not dead stones because the dead stones you cleaned out, which was the malice, the hypocrisy, the evil speaking. So now you must use living stones, stones that, that, that come off of, Jesus Christ. Because you are the temple of the living God. And this is where God is going to dwell. This is why you're going to get so much kickback. Because this is where God is going to dwell. It must be a holy place. A spiritual house. A place where God is willing to do dwell. Why? Because he says in verse 5. Because in this place, you are to offer up spiritual sacrifices. So you can't offer up spiritual sacrifices in a dead place. It must be a place of lively stones, a living place. So you can offer up spiritual sacrifices unto God. Hosea 14 and 2. Hosea 14 and 2. O Israel, return unto the Lord thy God, for thou hast fallen by thine iniquity. Take with you words and turn to the Lord. Say unto him, take away all iniquity and receive us graciously, so will we render the calves of our li the calves of our lips. Trying to see how this falls in. I'm trying to see how to say unto them, take away all iniquity and receive us graciously. So will we render the calf of our lips. Don't know how that tie in, but he says we must be it must be a holy place. With living stones. This is why we, again, we moved out the old dead stones and we bring in living stones. And where do we get these living stones? From the word of God, from Jesus. The living stones would be 
Let's look at let's look at Peter. Let's look. Let's go real quick over to uh, Peter. Second. Let's go to Second Peter. Go over to Second Peter, chapter one, because we're looking at the 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 living stones. Because the dead stones again was the hypocrisies, the evil speaking, the the uh, envies, the, those things we cleared out. And so now that we're building on the new house, he says, in Second Peter one. He says, um, whereby given in verse four, whereby given unto us exceeding great and precious promise that by these ye are made partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And and beside this, giving all diligence add to your faith. So a stone of faith must be there first. We must believe. Right. Um, that was back in salvation. We must believe before the confession was even made. So faith, virtue, knowledge, these things are we, this is the diagram. This is the diagram of what we are to, how we are to build on Jesus Christ. Knowledge, temperance, and temperance, patience, and patience, godliness. Because remember, it has to be godly because it's a, a spiritual house that, that's going to offer up spiritual sacrifices to God. And to godliness, brotherly kindness, we can't leave out people. We got to be kind to one another. And to brotherly kindness, charity. Charity is love. We got to love. These are the stones, a stone of charity, a stone of brotherly kindness, a stone of patience, a stone of temperance, a stone of knowledge, a stone of virtue, and a stone of faith. Amen. So these are the stones. And what do these stones do? These stones allow us to build on Christ. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful. So now, so now you a benefit. You are a benefit unto God. Now God desires to dwell there in you because you're using the correct material based on the diagrams that has been given to us and the materials that are available to us, adding nothing to it and taking nothing away from it. We're doing exactly what he said, because this is a perfect building. It is only perfect in the spirit through Christ. Because it's going to be able to offer up spiritual sacrifice acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. We're going to stop right here. And next week we're going to go into wherefore also it is contained in the scriptures. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confound. Amen. God bless you. I pray that the bishops, that's is a blessing to you. This was really good today. And, and Jesus, the cornerstone, Jesus, the cornerstone of our life. God bless you and may heaven smile upon you. And again, this is our anniversary month. If you're, if you're, if you're free, please come in as we wind down our Crab Feast is this week coming up, the 21st. If you haven't got your tickets yet, please get, please get your tickets and, and be a part of the Crab Feast. All is available. God bless you.